Thank you for joining us in the studios of Hopewell Valley Central High School. Today, parents, teachers, and educators are joined together to have a conversation with our principal, Mr. Dave Oliver. Um, I, I believe we'll talk about a variety of topics today, and I hope that this conversation will remain casual and comfortable. And I want you all to speak your minds and to feel free to, to ask questions and to say things that you think um, are important issues in our high school. I would like to introduce Mr. Dave Oliver, and the, the panel will introduce itself, and then Mr. Oliver will speak to us. Hello, I'm Dave Oliver. I'm the principal of Hopewell Valley Central High School. I'm completing my sixth year as the principal, and I've had lots and lots of fun. My name is Cheryl Stone. I'm a parent um, of two teenagers, and I'm the chairperson of the Hopewell Valley Municipal Alliance. And I am Kat Barnwell. I am a first-year teacher, um, freshman class advisor, and also having a great time. <laughs> I'm Mike Larico. I teach business ed here, and I came in with Mr. Oliver, and I think I was the first person he hired. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm Botchel Cole, and I'm a senior here at Hopewell Valley Central High School. When we got together for this program, we uh, gave some thought to what it was we wanted to talk about, and it's sort of um, <coughs> ironic that I got up this morning and uh, remembered that when we get back here on January 5th, 1998, I will only have six months left before I retire. And so I've uh, you know, given some thought to looking back on uh, where we were and where we are and perhaps where we want to go. Um, as I said earlier, it's been uh, lots and lots of fun for the past five and a half years. And some of my uh, earliest memories of this school and of this building are uh, obvious because when I came here in July of 1992, uh, I started working at Timberlane because we were under our first summer of many summers of construction. And I remember uh, very clearly uh, what this place looked like and what it looks like now. And those of you who are freshmen, sophomores, and juniors probably don't remember how dingy and run down things were and you probably haven't seen the changes over the number of years that I have. And obviously, in addition to all of the renovations and all of the changes, was the big addition to the science rooms and the, uh, the music rooms this past year that were opened into September. So there's been a major physical change in the appearance of the building, all for the benefit of, uh, of all of us and all for the betterment of the school. We also, when I came here, remember that we had typewriters and we didn't have computers. And uh, now we have well over 200 computers that are available for use, and technology has come a, a long, long way in that short period of time. But I also think that the uh, most lasting impression that I will uh, take with me when I retire is that when I started working here, um, I believed that school should become a student-friendly uh, environment, that um, the principal should be someone that knew the students, that our faculty and students and parents should all try to work together and come together and be a, a little more civil and a little more humane to one another. And I remember the first year I was here uh, saying good morning, how are you, how are you doing to everybody all of the time and being um, kind of shocked by the fact that most of the students wouldn't look at you and wouldn't address you. And my wife came to the first dance with me and she was amazed that no one uh, really seemed to be into dancing and really into speaking and to being friendly. And she came to the prom that year with me and she said to me on the way home, things have really changed. So I worked really, really hard to try to make this an environment where, uh, where children come first, where students come first, where your opinion is valued. Um, I know that some of the measures that we've taken over the years, uh, some of you have appreciated and some of you think that we treat you like adults but others think that we still treat you like little kids and we don't need hall monitors and why are we cracking down on some things and, and that nature. Um, but it's been fun. I've really enjoyed working with the students, working with the staff, uh, working with uh, the parents. I, I look out over this audience and there are two people, uh, Zave and Sam, whose uh, older sisters were in my first class and that's hard to believe that they've been out of here for over five years. And, and I look into the audience of parents and I uh, see Mrs. Grams and Sonny was one of my first all-time favorites, and I, I see uh, um, other people that have been very, very close and very dear to me. In the process of looking for a, a new principal to replace me, uh, I'm happy to say that there were a number of applications that were screened yesterday, and they decided to invite 12 people, males and females, 
from New Jersey and from out of New Jersey in for interviews sometime during January. So the replacement process is, is moving along. Um, a couple of words about where do we go? What's the future look like? Uh, I think we're going to grow. And I read things in the newspaper, a lot about sewers and development. And I wonder about what that impact will be in terms of the community. I think that I don't know where we go with technology into the 21st century. I expect that by the time my grandson, and you all know the story of my little grandson, um, <laughs> But by the time Austin is in high school, I expect school to be very, very different from what it is now. And I don't know how much interaction there will be with uh, technology and with uh, information sources and things of that nature. So I think things will change. Um, I'm very optimistic about the future of this school district. And uh, I expect to, to try to keep an eye on this place from a distance. Uh, I have to say this, that when I came here, I was a football fan and a football fanatic. And I didn't know too much about soccer, but I took so much pleasure in watching uh, the soccer program over the years that I do know the difference between a handball and what is not a handball. <laughs> and I took a great deal of pleasure in watching this year's boys varsity soccer team, uh, whom nobody expected to, to be so good win the conference championship. So it's been lots of fun. And as you do things for the last time, some of it I am so glad it's the last time. <laughs> and others of it, uh, bring back uh, lots of memories and I think, gee, I'm never going to be doing this again. And that's nostalgic for me. Um, and I'd be happy to entertain your questions and encourage you to, you know, to say what it is that you want to mm -hmm. say, whether you're a, a parent or a staff member or a, a student. I wonder if we could start out with um, only from the frame of reference of um, you're leaving, we're staying. Um, what are the issues uh, of <coughs> concern on your mind that will um, be the issues that will be the foundation for where we go as a school community from this point on? Well, I think one of the issues is going to, uh, to deal with the financing of public education. And I don't just mean in Hopewell Valley, I mean across the state. Um, education is expensive. And if we uh, continue to grow and have more and more students, it's not a direct payoff in terms of taxation for the building of new buildings and things of that nature. I think I continue to be concerned, and, and Cheryl, you know we share this concern about the fact that uh, this community needs to do something to provide some first-rate recreational facilities for the young people of the community. Uh, and that's coupled with uh, you know, concern about uh, too much risk-taking on the part of, of teenagers in terms of, uh, of some of the things that, that have happened in terms of parties and things of that nature. Um, but I feel real comfortable and real confident that this place is going to is going to be fine. Um, and as I said, I will keep in touch with it. I will. I think I will know what's going on, and uh, and I will wonder. And uh, I tease the secretaries all the time that I'm going to come in early and make the coffee anyway and then go home. But I won't be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe at this point, if there are questions or concerns issues or responses that anybody in the audience would like to raise, um, or perhaps the panel would like to, uh, to just re react to Mr. Oliver's comments so far? Uh, I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> um, I've been in the school district for, I guess, a little over two years now, although I've, I've only been teaching, certified teacher, for about a year. And, and I've seen a lot of changes in the building. Um, I've seen some policy changes occur within the last year. And I was wondering if you were making plans with policy, knowing that, um, that you are leaving, and trying to put some kind of a safeguard in place uh, before, before your retirement. Well, I think I've had a hand in changing some of the policies, and I, I, I think uh, I've been cooperative in trying to initiate some things. Uh, the whole issue of smoking, um, smoking will, will never go away uh, completely, but we've done a pretty good job of, uh, of removing smoking from school property and from the building, and everyone was afraid that the extension of the, of the smoking policy to, to the sight line would be a, a major problem. It hasn't been, and that's because uh, students have really cooperated with that. And that's not you know, a, um, a terrorist activity on the part of the administration. That's just a concern for health. I think everybody knows that uh, 
young people begin to smoke because their friends mm -hmm. smoke, and it's just, you know, want to try one of these things. So I've had something to do with that. Um, last year we had uh, uh, some theft that went on in our locker rooms. Uh, last year we had uh, a number of uh, conflicts among students, um, more than we'd had in previous years. And so we went back to reinstituting hall monitors, and that was a, uh, a, an effort on our part to, uh, to make people be comfortable and be secure, even though some people take that as our being in their face in the kind of situation. Um, is it readiness for me to leave? Uh, no, I think it's just appropriate timing and appropriate uh, response to what is needed and what the community would like to have. Um, Mr. Alvarez, I'd play, as I played a lot of sports, I noticed you were at most of the games um, for soccer, and you always tried to make it out to uh, some of the other meets also. Um, how personable do you, do you feel that that the new principal will be, and do you think that you'll try and help them adjust to this kind of community that you created? Well, I, I, I would uh, hope and pray that uh, whoever becomes a new principal will have the opportunity to carve out uh, his or her own niche and own personality, but um, I happen to love what I've been doing for 35 years, and, uh, and I love being involved with kids, and I just think it's part of my job as principal to, to be at dances, to go to basketball games, to uh, you know, to be here for the bonfires and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I think that kind of builds a, um, a sense of community, a sense of trust. Um, you know, I look around the, the, uh, the auditorium here and uh, except for the freshmen in the front row, I, uh, I think I know everyone by, by name and I think I've had a conversation with many. And I think that's important. I think we live in a society that um, impersonalizes life much too much and, and that worries me. Anyone in the audience who'd like to make a comment or raise a question <coughs> or perhaps um, respond to Mr. Oliver's perception of his accessibility and, and his approach to school environment? Come on up here. Um, I'm Scott Shalangoski. Um, I was wondering uh, your position on the new drug policy. Uh, my position on the new drug policy, Scott, is that, uh, <coughs> you know, 10 years ago I thought that what we ought to be doing with uh, people who abuse drugs and alcohol was to, uh, to try to understand, to understand, to understand, to understand, and to counsel. Uh, over, over the last 10 years I've come to the conclusion that uh, some people need to suffer the consequences of their actions. Um, so I think that the 10-day out-of-school suspension and the mandatory counseling that's involved is, is a is a necessary step. Um, I didn't enjoy the uh, recent expulsion that we had, but I think it, it needed to be done and it needed to be a message that was sent. Um, you know, we think we're doing something, when we abuse drugs and alcohol, we're, we're doing something that's illegal, <coughs> but even more important than that, we're doing something that's potentially tremendously dangerous. I know, but like, I'm, I'm all with that, like all the, like if you abuse drugs, you should get in trouble, but like, say marijuana it stays in your system for 30 days if you experiment like all kids like experiment I'm not saying all kids but some kids experiment if it stays in your system for 30 days and say like people are getting busted because they go down to the nurse and they're tired mm -hmm. and the nurse is like well we're going to drug test you like um, that's just a little bit okay on the harsh right. side it it, uh, it may be construed that way Scott um, you know normally uh, you have to uh, have some kind of behavior that makes us very suspicious. You know, you're, uh, you could be off the wall, you could be very sleepy, you could have your pupils dilated, you could be red-eyed or whatever. Uh, but when a teacher uh, suspects that, you know, under law we are supposed to, you know, do an investigation and if we have any doubt at all we are supposed to send that student out <coughs> for testing. Um, you know, there's, there's lots to say about how long marijuana stays in your system. Uh, I've had students tell me that they are going to test positive for marijuana and the tests have come back negative. Uh, but if you talk about a, a student population of 869 students, uh, we have sent out uh, no more than eight or ten <coughs> students this year for drug screens. And some of those have been positive and some of those have been negative. I don't think we're too harsh. I think we're worried. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, Mr. Oliver, if I may continue um, with Scott's area of questioning. Um, I'm, I'm concerned uh, about the young people that I see in the school and, and who we know are at-risk students. Um, and although we understand that there is the consequence <coughs> side to their actions, what do you think might be a good way for us to go in, in helping these students? Yeah, that's a great question, Kat. And uh, you know, every time I think I have an answer to that, uh, something happens that says I don't have an answer to it. But I think that we need to, um, I think we need to probably go back to our family roots and uh, and spend more time together. Um, you know, if you if you take a poll of your students in your English classes uh, and ask them how many times they sit down at the dinner table with mom and dad and their siblings. Uh, we'll all be surprised because we don't we don't have family time. We live in a very very busy busy time. Parents are are working. Parents have uh, uh, government commitments. Parents have uh, church commitments. You know we're on the go, and and you guys are on the uh, you guys. You're not a student anymore, <laughs> but the you know, the kids are on the go all the time, and and everybody has such a hectic schedule. So I think we need to probably you know sit down and talk a little bit, and sit down and, and reexamine how important the values are. Um, we, we send home from the Healthy Communities, Healthy Youth, uh, a list of 150 neat things to do for your kid. Um, and that, there's some neat things in there, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, tell your kid every day that you love them. Um, I don't do that. I wish I had done that when, when, my, when I had my kids. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to do some of that. And I don't think that, uh, that zapping somebody and saying you're gone forever uh, is, is an answer. Uh, I think it's a, it's a strong message that says stop but the next step is to get some kind of help. I mean, whether that's counseling, or whether that's having to go to a hospital to dry out, uh, whether that's getting involved in a 12-step program, I, I think there has to be more than just the discipline that's involved. Do you think that there might be some programs that we can institute in-house as teachers, as parents, as students to help our at-risk? Yeah, I, I think there is. Uh, uh, I think the whole concept of, uh, of mentors and the concept of uh, advisor advisees uh, programs are real important. If, if you've made a connection with someone significant during the day, if you're a kid and you made a connection with an adult, and I think if you're an adult and you made a connection with a kid, you're gonna, chances are you're going to be a lot healthier. Uh, trying to build in an advisor advisee program where there would be somebody that would be responsible for, uh, for Jay and Kate and Stephanie and you know everybody would be really a, a good thing, but it's so hard to do when you have the crowded curriculum. Mm -hmm. you know? It's more important to take X number of courses than, than it is to, to make a personal connection. And that's understandable, but it's maybe shouldn't be that way. Mm -hmm. So I think there are some things that can be done. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure how much um, like an active program that goes out and tries to get them would work because unfortunately, even if someone does have a problem, you can't help them unless they accept it, um, and if they don't, if they don't want help, you can talk in, to them until you're blue in the face, and it, it doesn't do anything, and that just frustrates you, and it, it gets the other person very angry. But I think the availability that that there would be someone to talk to, which I think we have here, um, we have a lot of peer programs and, and all of that. Um, I think that's just that's a pretty good start just to have someone there knowing that there's someone the students can talk to. Do we, do we often, I'm, I'm actually going to address this question to the audience if you don't mind. Um, do we often see those, the programs that we already have instituted in-house working? How many of you have used uh, one of the peer leadership people to help you with something or conflict mediation people? No one? How many of you know that those things exist? Okay. Now think about, have you ever known of a time when you might have used them? Can you think of a time where you were having a problem with another student or having a problem at home perhaps and somebody might have been of help to you? Do you know students that could use their help? Yes. Okay. Um, it seems, Mr. Oliver, that we're having a communication problem, I, I think, between what the, program, what the program's available and what the student body feels. Um. Mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, potentially the best programs that exist in this school is uh, is conflict mediation, and um, 
we've tried and tried and tried to have uh, conflicts referred to conflict mediators before they become problems. And it, and it hasn't been tremendously successful. But Ms. Clark has uh, decided that there's a, another way of doing that, and that's to train more and more and more individuals. Not necessarily that they're going to be <coughs> used as conflict mediators, but they can use the principles of problem solving and conflict mediation in, in their own personal lives. Um, I, I also don't know uh, how uh, effectively um, the, the staff, for instance, uh, refers people to conflict mediation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a teacher can see things happening in the classroom and, and can refer that and maybe nip it in the bud, and, and we haven't had a whole lot of success with that. Um, I think, uh, you know, there are a couple of peer leaders in this room, and I think, uh, you know, almost everybody in this room has had some opportunity to be involved in peer leadership, and that's a good thing, but that's the thing that has untapped potential here. And, uh, you know, we need a few good people to step forward and say, this is a program that I really want to be responsible for and I want to develop. Um, I, I, I've enjoyed, you know, my work with peer leadership, and I wouldn't want to give it up, but I don't think principals are the ones to do peer leadership programs. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably everybody in this room knows about the availability of Chris Lewis, who's our, our substance abuse counselor, and, and she's good. But uh, she's here three days a week to service grade 6 through 12, which is roughly uh, 1,500 students, and that's pretty hard to do. You know. um, we will add another guidance counselor next year, and I think that's helpful. If you're a guidance counselor and you have uh, 275 students to work with, that's pretty hard. If we cut it down to 200, that'll be more helpful. I think I'd just like to make a comment on the uh, students' response to, their, to the notion of their involvement in peer leadership or their knowledge about those programs and what that empowers them to be able to do on an informal basis. I think really the heart of Healthy Communities Healthy Youth is not so much focused on um, formal programs or meetings as much as it is focused on the individual and their feeling that they can make a difference and I think that applies certainly to the adults that we are talking to with the Alliance but also as I see kids in and out of my family room um, and uh, are part of their conversations um, throughout the community, you know what they <coughs> provide for each other in terms of support and um, I think the training that they receive as peer leaders or peer <coughs> mediators um, and their interaction with each other is, although they may not recognize it as um, connected to their training, um, is very much a byproduct of their training and sets a tone in the school both because of their commitment to um, not being involved in at-risk behavior and their care and concern for their community by taking that on as a responsibility, um, something that, uh, that I think we lose when we, when we kind of look for a show of hands. Mm -hmm. Comment from the audience on that, perhaps? Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Jay, and um, I'd like to know what you think about um, the drinking problem before the dances. What do I think about the drinking problem before the dances? I wish we didn't have a drinking problem before the dances, Jay. Um, and I don't want to dwell on that issue, but um, when you're the principal of the school and you're responsible for 300, 350, 400 students who come to a dance, uh, essentially your, your parents have entrusted your care and safety for three hours or so to me. And I take that responsibility very seriously. Um, I know students drink before they come to dances. I know students smoke pot before they come to dances, but I don't think it's most of them. I don't even think it's half of them, although some people would tell me I'm wacky because that's not so. So, um, you know, we try to do our best to keep you safe. And uh, apparently, uh, you know, drinking before going to high school dances is not unique to Hopewell Valley, but evidently it's been a Hopewell Valley tradition for years and years and years. All right, thanks. I wondered what um, some of the concerns that parents have as we anticipate um, a transition in our high school and leadership. Uh, what are the issues that are on your mind, both current issues and, and uh, maybe things that you're anticipating? Mm -hmm. 
Hi, I'm Cindy Pasolino, and I have uh, twin daughters who are juniors in the school. And I'd like to uh, have make a comment, and, and I also have a question. Uh, first, I'd just like to say that um, I've had the opportunity to work with Mr. Oliver on several different occasions and projects, and it's just been a pleasure. He's um, certainly always concerned about the students and their welfare, and my concern is that our next principal is as concerned and keeps the same friendly environment. Um, I remember one time we had Mr. Oliver for dinner, and the first thing my daughter said to me, that they were freshmen, they said, you're inviting the principal for dinner? <laughs> and then afterwards, they said, he is really a cool guy. And then they really enjoyed having him over after that. Um, my question is, how much involvement will you have in the choice of the new principal? Uh, I probably won't have any um, anything to do with the selection of the new principal. I, I will be responsible when they uh, when the committee decides who the final candidates are, whether it's two or three or four. Mm -hmm. I have the responsibility to uh, to host them for a day. Uh, we will set up a meeting with students and a meeting with faculty and a meeting with parents, and I'll, I'll try to you know to to tell them all the reasons why they might want to come here and to answer any questions that they might have. Uh, Dr. Thomas uh, always, when he interviews candidates for any positions, um, if I'm involved, he always asks me to write a paragraph or an impression about the person. Um, but there's a, uh, there's a committee that will be selecting the final candidates to come for interviews um, at some point in time, whether they do one or two, you know, ultimately the, the candidates, uh, they'll either go, you know, for site visitations to these person's schools. Um, and then the Board of Education will interview them. Ultimately, uh, I believe it's the recommendation of the superintendent to the school board and then the action of the school board. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what's going to happen, <laughs> but I don't want to make anybody nuts either in, in terms of that. So thank, thank you for your kind words. Suzanne Shetler, I'm a parent of two children, uh, two old children. Um, my daughter was a sophomore when Mr. Oliver came to the school, so she had had a little bit of experience with um, the school environment before Mr. Oliver came. And I remember she came home from school one day and she said, oh, Ma, Mr. Oliver came over to me today. And I said, oh, well, what happened? And she said, well, he, he said, hello, Lori. <laughs> and I said, what did he want? And she said, nothing. I just wanted to know how my day was, but he used my name. And I think that sort of summed up for me very quickly, and I think this was in October, very quickly what that environment was and what the change was, what this new experience was going to be. And I think that that's a great gift for any principal to give to kids. And you say, what do you worry about when you leave? Well, that they've had that kind of experience is absolutely fantastic because they know they have an adult who is their biggest advocate, and on top of that, he's their principal. So I would wish that for the next... Um, batch of kids to go through here that they can experience some of that because that's a great gift to go away with. So thank you for that. Thank you, Susan. I, I'd like to, to say <coughs> something I haven't heard from Mike and uh, <laughs> as Mike said <laughs> in, the, in the initial uh, <coughs> introductions, he was the first teacher I hired mm -hmm. and um, um, <coughs> you know, Mike's been through, uh, through all of the changes and all of the technology and uh, the growth of the, the business department and that sort of thing. Um, I'd like to share with you a little bit about one of the most exciting and most fun things about being a principal is is interviewing candidates and hiring people for new positions. And uh, you know, when when we interviewed Mike, I probably knew very very little about interviewing anyone for a business education position. But uh, over the years, uh, you know, now I've probably hired uh, or had a hand in hiring about. 35% of the staff, and that's really fun. And I just, so many of the, uh, the teachers that have come in in the past uh, five years uh, just bring a whole lot of enthusiasm and a whole lot of variety, and they mix really well with what was here, which was a really outstanding uh, seasoned bunch of teachers. Uh, you know, we have some teachers that have been here for a long time, and they are legends, and deservedly so. Uh, Mike's probably seen, uh, you know, I mean, I. He was one of those guys that taught typing on typewriters his first year. <laughs> um, I li I'd like to comment first on, um, on the technology. Um, I think we have gone a long way, and it's been um, 
through great efforts of, of many people, including Mr. Oliver's support of the technology and the community support of the technology. Um, we have come from keyboarding on typewriters, and um, I hope we never ever have to see them again, <laughs> to, um, to classes like Exploring the Internet and, and a class that will probably be offered next year, a second level internet course. And that's been in great thanks to Mr. Oliver and his support. Um, and I do have a question for you as well. With you at the, uh, at the end of the career tunnel and me just entering, um, with the explosion that we have here in population, where do we stand as far as, as resources and, and classroom sizes and, and things of that nature? Uh, Mike, I think uh, the answer to that is really going to probably be played out over the next six months to a year. Um, I, I'm not as, uh, as into the, the sewer development and the development projects as, uh, as the superintendent is and as a lot of people in the community are. Um, I know that uh, when I started at West Windsor Plainsboro uh, back in 1979, they had uh, roughly a thousand students in grades seven through twelve, and uh, and we had a lot of fun, uh, and it was a very personal touch. And when I left there after a long time, uh, we were up to 1,600 students almost in grades nine through twelve, and I think what suffers is the personal relationships. You know, there they now will have two high schools. Um, you know, there's something to be said about two high schools because it might keep relationships reasonable. A gigantic high schools or high schools that grow too rapidly, um, I think you, you, you suffer because you don't know people as well as you used to. Um, you know, I, I even know now in, in my own situation here, I used to know everybody. Now there are some people I don't know, and I don't, I don't like that. But that, I think that would be the biggest change, Mike. Um, you lose that touch. If you get to be too big, I think you lose what's important. Uh, Mr. Oliver, would you like to give us some closing comments? Um, some closing comments, uh, sure. Um, I think I wanted to be a teacher from the time I was 11 years old, um, but I never admitted it until I was 21 or 22. Um, and I probably wanted to be a principal a lot longer than I ever admitted it. Um, and I will tell you that uh, those of you who don't know what you want to do when you grow up, whether that's the students or the parents in the audience, because <laughs> I'm not finished growing up either, um, consider um, the, the wonderful opportunities and the wonderful uh, treasures that can be yours if you're a teacher. I don't think there's anything better in, in all of the world, uh, maybe except being a parent, uh, than being a teacher. It's just it's exciting, it's fun, it's challenging, it's frustrating, it's uh, aggravating, it's euphoric, it's just uh, neat stuff. And uh, you know, there are a lot of people that are my age who are going to be retiring in the next uh, two, three, four, five, six years. So hopefully there'll be lots and lots of teaching jobs. So I would encourage some of you young people to, to give some thought to that. Um, you may not drive a Mercedes Benz to school, but you'll be rich. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, well I'd like to thank the panel and the audience for joining us in the studio today. And I guess we'll wrap that up. Thank you. <laughs>